Please welcome Matthew Ruffle. Hi everyone, so my name is Matthew Ruffle. I'm going to give my talk, Maintaining the Unmaintainable, Picking Up the Baton of a Secure Kernel Patch Set. So just before I start, I just got to say a couple things. This talk's going to be talking about the status of some patch sets and some features of some patch sets. Now this reflects my fork called Dapper Secure Kernel Patch Set and its stable variant. Now, this talk does not represent the current status or features of the current GR security patch set made by Open Source Security Inc. Now, there is going to be some overlap. That's due to Dapper Secure Kernel Patch Set being a fork which branched off from two years ago. And I'm not affiliated with Open Source Security Inc. or have anything to do with the company or the current GR security patch set. I make this absolutely clear. So there's a kernel patch set called GR Security, and it's, you know, it focuses on improving security. It's made by Open Source Security Inc. It's been around a long time, nearly 20 years in fact, and it's contained a lot of technological breakthroughs throughout the years, such as address space layout randomization, which is now implemented in pretty much every mainstream operating system, and SMAP, which is advanced memory segmentation, which is literally baked into the silicon and your Intel processes. In April 2017, Open Source Security, they basically decided to pull their public releases, um, and they, they suggested that the community step up and maintain it themselves. Now, at the time, I was developing my own secure Linux distro called Dapper Linux, and it uses a GR security patched kernel, so I was kind of stuck. It was a huge spanner in the works, and you know, I had to do something about it, because either I, I don't have a distro anymore, or I you know, step up, learn kernel development, and maintain the patch set by myself. And that's what I did. Um, even though I was a complete kernel newbie at the time. I ended up being the last maintainer for a public release of the patch set in its entirety, which is pretty cool. So the purpose of this patch set is to go above and beyond upstream in terms of security and hardening. Um, it doesn't focus so much on fixing individual instances of bugs, but instead eliminating entire classes of vulnerabilities. Um, the goal is to attain self-defense against unknown exploits, and because of this, a patch kernel is typically not affected by the latest exploit to, you know, hit mailing lists. The idea is to basically increase the cost of exploitation, because, you know, most normal exploits will fail. So the ones that do work, they're more valuable, right? Attackers now need to weigh up the risk reward when they're going after a target. You know, do I go attack this target and risk revealing that I have this exploit that works, or do I keep it secret and use it for later? So this patch set has a reputation for being pretty scary, and I myself find it absolutely terrifying. Um, so it comes as a single monolithic patch. And if you've never seen a patch before or a git diff, this is very much what the, it looks like. Um, so it's made of hunks, hunks target sections of files, and you know, plus signs of lines being added and minus signs of lines being deleted. So my current fork, Dapper Secure Kernel Patch Set Stable, um, weighs in at 10.3 megabytes in size. This is a plain text file, right? at 253,675 lines of code, of 113,845 insertions, and 32,669 deletions. Um, so it spans over 3,422 files. And to tell you the truth, this patch sheet is absolutely ginormous. So this patch sheet's also pretty scary because documentation is, is very sparse and quite often out of date. Um, so the best source of documentation are plain text files written by the PAX team. He explains most features in detail, but they were written in the early 2000s, like 2001 and 2002, and they're starting to get quite out of date. Um, Open Source Security Inc. used to maintain a, a GitHub mirror of their code base, and it was forked by Monopoly before it was pulled. And you can look through there to see some commit messages of when the features landed. Um, it's not so good for help these days when you get stuck, because it's you know, in the past and doesn't deal with the problems of today. You know, if you want a general idea of what the patch set does, you can read the kconfig entries. Um, but otherwise, you're basically left at the mercy of search engines and basically searching around a main list and forums if you get stuck and need help. This patch set's also scary because when you compile it, it does tend to break user space a little bit. Um, and it catches inexperienced users. So the very first time I booted a patch kernel, I, you know, it started up fine. I was like, yes, I'm going to be secure now. Then all of a sudden, GDM just dies, right? So it gets seg faulted. So GDM violates an mProtect principle. Um, the kernel didn't like that, so of course it just killed it. But 
you know, the init system didn't notice that GDM had died and all my virtual terminals were busted and weren't working, so I basically balked my install. Um, very fun. So the patch set basically focuses on technological greatness. It throws maintainability completely out the window. Um, so there's, there's not a lot of comments inside the patch set either. You're mostly just staring at, you know, diffs. All right, so you're probably sitting there wondering, like, how are these classes' vulnerabilities eliminated? So I'll give you a quick overview of the features. So the patch set's mostly split into three sort of parts. We have GCC plugins, we have some core kernel enhancements, and a whole bunch of miscellaneous fixes. Um, now, a lot of these do break user space or have significant performance impact. Like, you can't just get, like, mitigating all these classes of vulnerabilities for free. You have to pay for it. You pay for it through slightly broken user space or high performance impact. So GCC plugins. The idea behind the GCC plugins in this patch set are intended to you know, greatly improve security for the least amount of effort. So the idea is that they're easy to maintain and they're portable. So you can move them between different architectures with basically no code changes. You can even use them in programs which aren't the kernel, such as core utils. Um, the idea is to re reduce the amount of work for automation and keep the patch set smaller because you don't have to include a whole bunch of trivial patches. First up is Pax Constify plugin. Basically, this acts on structs that only contain function pointers. The idea is to make all the fields constant, just so during runtime, like you can't actually modify these function pointers or overwrite them. And it's denoted by the no const and do const annotations. There's grcurrentseq range struct. Basically, this is again for structs that only contain function pointers. It randomizes the layout of structs. So structs will have a base address and they'll have fields inside of it. All the fields get randomized to different locations. If an attacker was you know, making an exploit that required um, knowledge of a particular function pointer, suddenly it adds the requirement they need an info leak to be able to track down where on that struct that function pointer is placed. So it just makes the attacker's life harder. Um, this isn't as effective on distro kernels because attackers could just pull down a copy of the kernel, right? Figure out what seed was used during build and use that to de-randomize. Um, so it's excellent if you compile your own kernel, but I'm guessing not a lot of people compile their own kernels these days, right? Um, so it's still worthwhile for distros because you know each build uses a different seed. So if an attacker was going to um, try and exploit like a large organization, not everyone would be running the exact same kernel update because they might be a week or two behind. Um, so the seed will be different on all those builds. It's noted by the randomized layout annotation and it's upstream by Casecock in Linux 4.13. We've got PAX memory stack leak. Basically, right before a syscall returns, the kernel stack that was used during that syscall is erased. The idea is to prevent info leaks from uninitialized variables left on the stack. And what I mean by that is that, you know, C is a, C is a pretty basic programming language. If you don't initialize variables at the start, they take whatever value was, was there in memory. Um, if something juicy was there, like kernel pointers, you could use those kernel pointers to, you know, de-randomize where the kernel is placed in memory and defeat kernel address based ra layout randomization. Um, it also removes secrets faster, so that's good if you have any keys hanging around. And it's upstream by Alexander Popov in Linux 4.20. We've got PAX memory struct leak. Basically, when a struct's being copied from kernel space to user space, all uninitialized variables will be initialized to zero. And again, it just stops those information leaks we were talking about before. And this was also upstream by Casecock in Linux 4.11. There's pack size overflow, which is a pretty cool plugin. Basically, it, it detects and reports integer overflows and underflows, so you can you know, get around to fixing them. Um, so it, it does this by working on the size T type. So it instruments the, the, the code with double wide integer types. So if, if the variable in play was a 32-bit unsigned integer, the compiler would said use a 64-bit unsigned integer. Um, and then during runtime, it just watches like the increments and that sort of thing. And you can check to see if the variable has overflowed by checking the higher bits, right? If it's exceeded the value of a 32-bit unsigned integer, you can check the higher bits past that. If they're set, then you've probably overflown, in which case the plugin will log the D message and send a SIG code to the process, so it prevents exploitation. If this plugin was going to be upstreamed, that's probably a little heavy-handed. Um, people probably don't want their uh, processes being killed like that. Uses the intentional overflow annotations, and it's for things that are required to overflow, like your timer counters. Um, and the cons is that it requires you to keep around a hash table of all the functions in the kernel and their signatures. 
And you have to generate this every time you add a new function, so pretty much every release. There are shell scripts that automate this, but it's just more effort. And we got PAX wrap. So this basically prevents code reuse during exploitation. If you saw Joel's talk previously, he explained how ROP and JOP works. Basically, ROP and JOP, they add on a whole bunch of different stack frames with return addresses that point to um, text in, in your application or, or kernel. Um, there's groups of instructions which are quite useful, and they're called gadgets, and they perform an action, like you know, adding or subtracting or doing something like that. And if you string enough of those gadgets together, you can form a program. And you can get Turing complete compilers that work on gadgets. Um, it's very cool. But PaxRap basically shuts down this exploitation method for two ways. Um, the first one is that it implements forward and backwards edge control flow integrity. Um, it basically calculates a hash of the functions um, and their signatures of functions that we're allowed to jump to and return back from. Um, if we try to return back from a function or jump to a function of a different hash, then we're probably going to somewhere that we weren't intending to go. So execution stops. Secondly, it also implements a, a probabilistic guarantee that we actually return back to our intended target. So it kind of encrypts the return address and places on the stack. You know, upon return, you, you decrypt it and it compares it with the actual return address. If they don't match, then we're probably gone to somewhere different and execution stops. And it's probabilistic because the key is vulnerable to be leaked because it's stored in a reserve CPU register, which isn't infallible. So kernel enhancements. These are basically like fully fetched features which are implemented like in the core of the kernel. They're mostly if def and end diffed out with their config flags, and they're very tightly coupled to the subsystem of the feature being hardened. First up is PAX mProtect, and it hardens the mProtect syscall. If you're not familiar with how mProtect works, Basically, it changes the execution status of pages. So the hard thing makes mProtect no longer make pages executable when they weren't ex executable in the first place. Um, it doesn't make read-only executable pages writable because that would violate um, write, XOR, execute, which is you can have one but not both. Um, you can't make executable pages from anonymous memory, and you can't made, make read-only after relocations data pages writable again because that kind of defeats the whole purpose of Railroad, right? If you relocate a data page and then make it read-only, you shouldn't be able to make it writable again, right? And this feature is definitely the most seen by GRSEC users, because it has the biggest impact on breaking user space. You know, Python, Java, GNOME Shell, Firefox, um, they all violate this feature in some way or another. Um, you can disable it via extended file attributes, but it's something that you learn once everything's crashed on you. This PAX kern exec basically enforces write, XOR, execute kernel pages, pretty similar to the mProtect hardening, and extends this loadable modules. And we've got PAX memory UDRF, which is one cool little feature. Basically, it prevents the kernel from dereferencing user space pointers when the kernel expects kernel space pointers. Um, it also stops the kernel execution flow from leaving kernel space and entering user space. So by doing this, it basically prevents all return to user space and return to directly map memory exploits which is very nice. Um, and it's implementation on 64-bit x86. Um, so it implements different page global directories per CPU. Um, and it has dedicated ones for kernel space use and for user space use, so they don't get mixed up. Now, KPTI kind of dabbles in this. And we're going to talk about this later, because um, it kind of breaks things. I want it to be a talk about mentioning address space layout randomization. Now, this has basically mostly been upstream now, but if you don't know what it does, it randomizes the base address of all the processes on execution. So every time you run a process, it's loaded into a different place in memory. Um, and it's nice because it prevents exploitation where you have to know addresses in order to get the exploit working, like your stack buffer overflows. It mostly reduces attackers to you know, guessing. And it's been extended to you know, the, the kernel, so you can, the kernel's loaded in different places in memory on each boot. Um, the, the patch sheet extends it with PAX RAN K stack, which randomizes the kernel stack, and RAN U stack, which randomizes the user stack. There's PAX memory sanitize. Basically, the kernel erases all memory pages and save objects as soon as they're freed, and the idea is to reduce the lifetime of secrets. It's good for short-lived applications or processes because the secrets will be wiped faster. It's not so ideal for long-lived processes because you know, the secret is going to be exposed for slightly longer. Um, it has a nice side effect of being able to detect you stuff, you stuff the free on structs that contain pointers. Because if you try and deref one of those pointers, that points to a, a page which has been 
erase, it causes an access violation, which is useful to forward debugging. There's PAX ref count. Basically, it detects and prevents object reference counters from overflowing. Um, sometimes, overflowing reference counters are freed, but they're kind of still in use. It leads to some pretty exploitable conditions. Um, so it's built on top of the Atomic T infrastructure, uh, and it's replaced by Atomic Uncheck T, and then the fun associated functions like Atomic Add, Atomic Deck, the extended to Atomic Unchecked Add, Unchecked Deck. This was upstream by many cool developers in Linux 4.11, 13, and 15, and it's known as the RefCount T infrastructure upstream. We've got PAX user copy. Basically, it makes the kernel enforce fixed sizes when copying objects between the kernel space and user space, and vice versa. Um, it prevents information leaks from you know, uninitialized data when one side asks for too much from the other. Like if user space asks for an object which is obviously too large, the, the user space will only get the actual size and not the, the memory that it asked for. And it has a nice side effect of preventing kernel heap overflows. There's also some pretty extensive chair root hardening in this patch yet. Basically, it really locks down these chair roots and enforces some pretty strict access controls, and it treats them more like jails rather than the, the soft isolation they are in uh, vanilla kernels. Um, the cons of this is that you can't turn these features on or off with specific chair roots. It's compiled into the kernel, right? You either have it on for all of them or on for none of them. Um, my favorite features are disabling mounting from within chair roots or preventing double chair roots, so you can't make a chair root inside of a chair root because you can use that to escape back to the outside, or um, preventing being able to send signals or tracing processes outside of your chair root. There's a whole bunch of miscellaneous fixes. They're mostly just small bug fixes noticed during forward ports and watching daily commits. Um, sometimes there's some serious zero days included and they don't really get mentioned until someone fixes them upstream and then there's a Twitter post saying, you know, it's been fixed for like the last four years. Um, but a lot of these now have been upstreamed. So on the 26th of April 2017, Open Source Security Inc. put this notice on their website that they were passing the bat in. They basically said, today we're handing over future maintenance of the GR security test patches to the community. The dedicated maintenance of a security centric code base provides the Linux community with a unique opportunity to gain experience in kernel security, fostering a new generation of security minds. So it was pretty clear that um, they were fed up with people just copy pasting their code and upstreaming it and not having too many unique ideas of their own. So they, they kind of pulled public patches in an effort to get the community to start thinking themselves and maybe even maintain this patch set themselves. Um, so they only left their previous patch to Linux 4.9.24, which is okay, it's an LTS release. Um, they had some simple rules that the patch set had to be renamed and all the branding had to be stripped out, but that's not too bad. Um, but it's pretty clear from the features that I explained before that there's some pretty large shoes to fill. Now at the time, I was building my secure Linux distribution, Dapper Linux. And the idea is that you bring together all the cool open source security projects together in one easy to use distro that you can just boot up on a live CD and check them all out, right? Now its kernel was a GR security patch kernel and I had pretty much every security feature turned on and running. I spent a long time going around all my applications seeing the right protect flags so they all worked flawlessly. Um, in terms of user space, it's, it's got sandboxing. All the applications are, use Flatpak, which is cool. Um, but all of a sudden, I was, I, was, I was left high and dry. I don't have a kernel anymore. I'm not going to get updates. What am I going to do? So I don't really want to give up on the technological advancements that the patch set provides. I thought it was pretty cool, and I wanted to sort of learn how it worked. Now, at the time, I was a complete kernel newbie. I'd only compiled my kernel, like, my first kernel, like, five months prior. Um, but I decided to learn kernel development and keep it and try and maintain the patch set for as long as I could. I treated it as a call to adventure. It wasn't a bad thing. It was something that it was an opportunity for me to learn something. So I was like, okay, let's go. So the first thing I did was I attempted to port the patch yet to new major kernel versions. Um, so 4.9 is a nice stable LTS, right? 4.10 was out or at that time, and 4.11 was literally a week away. So I was like, if I sit around, I'm going to get too far behind, and I'm never going to be able to forward port this patch yet. So the first thing I did was that I split the big monolithic patch into individual files. 
all the hunks that belong in a particular file goes and lives in a file by itself. So I now had 3,500 different files, right? That's when I started to do some pretty naive attempts to you know, automate maintenance of this patch set. So you get merge, your, your patch with the fuzz level set on. But then I found a tool called Wiggle, and there's a screenshot of Wiggle up here. It's basically this cool little terminal tool that has a nice n -curses interface. Um, you can scroll through all these different patches, and you can see if Wiggle can automatically wiggle the patches into place, now the green ones. The blue ones, they don't need anything done to them. The red ones, are, you know, they need some attention that you have to do yourself. So I basically wiggled everything to place and fixed the ones that Wiggle couldn't do. But when I was fixing all the compile errors, there was a lot of incorrect fuzzy placement. Some lines were like duplicated or put in the completely wrong place. And if you've got a patch set with 113,000 insertions, and this is in kernel land too, right? You're gonna get some strange behavior if you have duplicated lines. So I was like, you know what, well, this, this isn't gonna work. So I, I abandoned it and reverted all of my patches. And I just used the standard patch tool with the fuzz level set to zero. So if even one line was out, then I had to manually fix it, which was very tedious. So if you wanna know how much effort it takes to sort of forward port between versions, um, I, I dug out my Git history. So I skipped from going 4.9 to 4.10 because 4.11 was literally out when I decided to take on this project. Um, so between 4.9 to 4.11, um, I actually completed this port at the start, there were 75 files with 134 hunks in conflict, which doesn't actually sound like that many, and it's not. But once you've actually started to fix compiler errors and stuff like that, you know, I, I changed 221 files with 1,258 insertions and 6,808 deletions. Um, and then I tried to boot, and then of course, you know, I got halfway through boot, and then it just stopped. And you're like, oh, okay, let's debug this. It's, Throw it in queuing memory, it's put GDB attached to this um, virtual machine, right? And, and then you see the backtrace and it gets stuck halfway through a block of assembly. And you're like, oh, by now 4.12 had been out for a week. I'm like, do I debug this or do I keep on chasing the latest upstream? So I was like, you know what, if I get behind, I'm never gonna be able to catch up. Let's keep chasing upstream. So going between 4.11 to 4.12, at the start, there was you know, 257 files now in conflict with 560 broken hunks. Um, I'd done about 70 of these files with 340 insertions and 796 deletions, but I got busy and demotivated because I think in 4.12, um, fifth level paging came in and I had to like extensively rewrite some of the MM stuff. I'm just like, let's just put, let's just deal with this later, you know? So I left most of it for 4.13. Then 4.13 came around, so I actually had to start doing something, right? So going from 4.12 to 4.13, um, at the start, there was 461 files now in conflict with 1,337 broken hunks. So I was like, okay. At the end of the forward port, like, I did finish it. There was 755 files changed with 3,390 insertions and 27,320 deletions. You can start to see how a lot of this patch yet was done to be upstreamed at this point in time, and you can definitely see that in the deletion count. Um, and it didn't compile because by then 4.14 was out. And I was like, you know what? I need to start chasing after that. Because if I can just get to 4.14, it's an LTS kernel, right? You can sit there for a couple of years and fix your compile errors and um, all the other bugs that stop it from booting. So I was like, okay, let's do this. At the start, there was 296 files in conflict with 493 broken hunks. Um, I did about 215 of these files. 846 insertions and 1,662 deletions, but I was kind of forced to rethink my strategy at this point. Because <laughs> <laughs> it turns out forward porting these major versions is actually really hard. Um, a lot of these bits require like pretty extensive rewrites and reworks, especially with that fifth level paging that came in. Um, and upstream changes and gets refactored absolutely continuously, so the core of the kernel keeps on moving as well. Um, and as time passed, the maintenance effort just, just increased exponentially. Um, a lot of it was trivial and pretty boring, but I still can't trust these automated tools because of the fuzz mistakes. So I was like, I still had to do things manually. Um, but when it comes down to it, like I couldn't even handle getting one major release working. I attempted forward port five versions. So you know, I was always playing the chasing game. A new major Linux was out before I managed to forward port to the last one. So I was like, okay. I need to rethink how this is gonna work. And at the same time, like, 
just want to say about Spender and the PAX team, they've, they've forward ported every single version from 2.4 to you know, the current release today, which is a ridiculously impressive effort considering the size of this patch set. All right, so major versions just aren't going to work. So I decided to sit on 4.9 LTS for a while because that's doable, right? Um, they're much more smaller and they're much more manageable. So I got into this sort of workflow. I would watch the Linux announce mailing list for when Greg KH posts new announcements or point releases. Um, I'd then go and read the change log in his announcement and figure out what had actually changed in his point release. I'd then get a diff and I'd read through all the diffs and see what had changed and try and link it to the, um, the change log messages. I'd then try and patch my patch set on top of those um, and get a list of conflicts. And then I'd go you know, fix those conflicts. Then I'd generate a test patch and check for if I actually fixed those conflicts and then do a quick compile just to make sure there wasn't any compile errors. Um, I then generate a release patch, sign up with my GPG key and upload it on GitHub for my users. Then I would go and compile a real release kernel and then I'd distribute out some packages. And Dapper Linux was a Fedora remix, so of course it's RPMs. But a couple of my users also packaged Debs and another covered Gentoo. Um, that's cool. And this all happened twice a week. Sometimes I wait until the weekend when you get busy, but this mostly happens twice a week, so it's actually, you know, maintaining this LTS release is a surprisingly amount of work. Now, I kept on doing this for about, you know, a year, year and a half, and everything was fine, but point releases just started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Like, they started out about 1,000 lines, right? Then they went to 2,000 lines, then 3,000 lines, and 4,000 lines. And every now and again, we get a freak 10,000 line point release. Now that's great, right? Lots of upstream stuff is being backported to 4.9, which is great. It needs it for longevity, right? Um, but it increases maintenance effort. Then Fedora changed its default compiler from GCC 7 to GCC 8. I managed to track down and fix most of the compile errors, but I'm having a couple problems with some of the GCC plugins, um, most notably size overflow. I still haven't quite worked out the problem yet, but you know, you feed literally the same SRPM to GCC 7, it works fine. GCC 8, it compiles, but it won't boot. It's very strange, I have to debug it sometime. Um, and then at the start of last year, Meltdown Inspector came out. And this really, really threw a spanner in the works. Like, ah, oh. okay. So talking back to that UDRF feature, right? How it modifies a lot of the core of the kernel. So in this implementation, it does have a per CPU page global directory, right? So KPCI also implements this but it implements it slightly differently. In the two implementations, they're not quite compatible and you can't quite merge them together to do the same thing. And there's numerous other instances in the patch set where it conflicts some of the, the specter mitigations, like there's some large blocks of assembly where um, just some XOR, you know, RX, RX, XOR, RBX, RBX instructions are inserted to zero out the registers after some calls were made. Um, so the patch set has been doing this for like the last you know, five, six, seven, maybe more years, right? But the, again, the two implementations were incompatible and I couldn't merge them together without like wrecking some things. So I had to change how I maintained the kernel. You know, it was pretty clear that the Meltdown Spectre mitigations just weren't going to gel with this patch yet. So I basically had to revert all the Meltdown Spectre mitigations, right? But it meant that in the future, I now have to cherry pick all my patches, taking the ones that don't have anything to do with Meltdown Spectre, and then reverting all the ones to do with Meltdown Spectre. But this is a problem, right? You're never ever supposed to cherry pick patches. That's one of Greg KH's golden rules. Um, so my users then had to decide, do they take the patch set of all this cool hardening, or do they move to an upstream kernel, have the Meltdown Spectre mitigations, and all the other cool stuff which has happened since then. And I, I lost a lot of users at this point. I'll just give a quick timeline of some maintainers. So Hard and Gen 2, they dropped the GRSEC patch set on the 19th of August, 2017. Um, Alpine Linux, the final release was on the 27th of November, 2017 at Linux 4.9.65. And they'd used the orange forward port for a short time, but then quickly moved to Monopoly's version. Um, Monopoly himself, his final release was the 4th of Jan, 2018 at Linux 4.9.74 after 50 releases, which is pretty good. Linux 4.9 was 0.75 was the release that Meltdown Spectre came out, so it was pretty clear that he couldn't get over that hurdle either. Um, and myself, my final release was on the 26th of October 2018 at Linux 4.9.135 after 111 releases, which is a pretty solid effort. So the future. 
Now, if I really wanted to, like I can continue maintaining 4.9, but it's just a huge time sink for not that many users. I'm down to about 12 core users now, um, so it's kind of not really worth the effort. And, and the patch sheet is starting to experience some pretty nasty bit rot. It's literally crumbling onto my keyboard. Um, so there's two real scenarios. You split out all the core features of the patch sheet, like the ones that I explained, and you, you, you put them into your own file. All the protect changes in one file. All the size overflow changes in one file. And you maintain those core features as a set, or you just cherry pick specific features and then upstream them, which is the view that the community has basically taken and is probably the right idea. So what I think should be kept in the future, um, I definitely think all the GCC plugins are definitely prime candidates to you know, maintaining and upstreaming because they have you know, the most benefit for the least work. Um, I can't promise upstreaming anything, but I am interested in size overflow, uh, packs memory sanitize, and the protect hardening. Um, so some lessons learned. There's some pretty wise words from Case Clock in an email that, you know, forks are always a risk. Um, if you depend on a fork for your project, you're at the mercy of whoever maintains this fork. They can go away at any time, and you have to be aware of this. If you aren't prepared to take on the project yourself to maintain it, you probably shouldn't use that fork. Um, and there'll always be another wall. I slammed into my first wall when the Meltdown Inspector mitigations came out, right? But I kind of got over it by ignoring it and reverting the patches and kept on moving. Um, but I slammed into it a second time when um, Greg KH decided to backport Object Tool from Linux 4.14 to 4.9. Um, it completely broke my patch set, and I, I had to end up reverting that as well. So I then had another thing to cherry pick around when I was maintaining the patch set. And I slammed into my third wall with the announcement of the, um, the more Spectre vulnerabilities that were discovered about three or four months ago. And that's when I decided to probably it's time to call it quits and move upstream. I just want to say that you also have it within you to maintain your favorite projects for a short while. Like, it doesn't matter if they, they went unmaintained. You can still get a copy of the source, learn about it, and maintain it for a short while. You're never going to be as good as the original developers, but you can definitely keep it alive for a year or two. Um, upstreaming will always have a larger impact on lifespan than forks. It's pretty clear. Um, you definitely see it in Android land and that sort of thing. And also, maintaining this patch yet has basically taught me so much about how the subsystems work, because um, it touches basically every corner of the kernel. So there's always a merge conflict in every corner of the kernel, right? So I got around and, and sort of saw the data structures and how everything integrated together, which is pretty cool. I've got some greets uh, to spend on the PAX team. Like, thanks for your hard work. Um, you've definitely changed the security community quite a lot. And Thank you for keeping releases free as long as you did. Uh, to Case Cook, thank you for your upstreaming efforts. Um, there was a lot of merge conflicts, and every time I looked them up, uh, your name was attached to the upstream commits. So I, I quickly learned, you know, oh, there's a merge conflict. Did Case upstream something? Oh, he did. Here we go. That's the source of my conflict. <laughs> um, thank you for that. And to Alexander Popov, like, Absolutely, congratulations for upstreaming Stack Leak. Like, I was reading the mailing list threads. Um, it was a long journey, but you got there, so congrats. If you're interested in perhaps trying out this patch yet, you can jump on my website and look it up, but otherwise, you can head to my GitHub repos. Um, only the stable variant works, of course. You can download the patch, patch your kernel, compile it, and run it, or you can just download a copy of Dapper Linux if you want to run a compiled, you know, already built version. Um, but otherwise, I'm Matthew Ruffle, and this is my talk. We have time for questions. I have to ask, uh, are you familiar with the utility called Midnight Commander? Yeah. And you know that you could use it to um, look into patches as files. No. Open up Midnight Commander, and if you, uh, I, I maintained the RT patch for several years, which is almost like, it, was a, it wasn't 10 meg, it was like 3 meg. Um, and we went through various things. Midnight Commander has been a godsend. You could go in and you could actually, uh, it looks like a file, you could enter into the file and you see all the patches as file, all the files within a patch become a file 
with a Midnight Commander, and you could copy, move them around, and a bunch of... It's a great tool for patch management. We have one monolithic, huge monster patch. Just want to let you know about that. Uh, you mentioned that um, UDREF helps with uh, mitigating uh, ret to dir attacks. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, so it's basically going back to the return to user space sort of thing. You can directly map memory to head to user space. So it blocks out going, leaving kernel space and heading to user space via directly map memory. I'm pretty sure that's how it's implemented. But like... If you really want to know, you can know for sure by um, pulling down the PAX team's plain text documentation on how he implemented it. Um, that's probably going to ask, answer your question. Well, I've read it. It doesn't. <laughs> Well, it's less a question, but uh, I can explain you what's my problem with GR security. Is it similar to yours, but a little bit different? Because I'm working downstream for company one and one Ionis, and we have used GR security, I think, longer than I'm in the company, and facing the problems you mentioned. But uh, from all of those features, we are using only 29. Okay, and most of them start with ch root. <laughs> Not something. So I have a different approach to the problem. At the, at the moment, we have uh, 3.16 in production. Okay, you ca can imagine why. Uh, well, it takes some time to get to the next, f uh, because the code is sold out to about 10,000 machines. Okay, so at the moment, I have prepared 4.4, and based on the GR security for that release, which is a lower number than yours. I have started uh, creating patch sets only for the um, uh, sure, on, only for, for the features, and I, at the moment I have eleven of them, and I want to publish them somewhere uh, that are more stable, and I have some experience from real data center, and I would provide it to you and to Case and other people just for reference. So my goal is not getting it upstreams but having a, a methodology how to look a uh, possibility of you of, of to these patches and i'm not file based i'm feature based so the base is uh, kconfig options and i have discovered several anomalies in the patch set in the original one uh, there are several features where no kconfig option exists but just by applying the patch it already is effective there's a lot of automatic and patches. Some of them should be created. Them, right? In one case, I have already created one, but there are several other ones. So I will invent new GR security options not present in, in the original patch. And then there are cyclic dependencies. And several other things we have just noticed. And I think Case knows, noticed also some of them. And I'm not yet sure what to do with them. So we should get into the, some discussion there. So it's not a question, but it's just a remark for me. And uh, I congratulate you that you tried it and it's clear to me that okay it's really unmaintainable you're right and uh, yes really uh, I, I just uh, i have no time uh, for gr security i have to do much uh, to do much of other work and this is uh, to survive i can only just draw out of uh, leeching out of what's important for me it's the only chance to survive this Any more questions? Um, if we can uh, all thank a scarily persistent and brave person. <laughs> oh, thank you for very much. Thank you.